Gather around, children. It's story time. I don't know. I guess it's just... I guess I just... I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess... I don't... My name is Mark McGinnis. I'm 30 years old. And, uh... Mostly from Iowa. But, uh, now I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, you know, I live with the, my mom some of the time and sometimes with my dad and my grandma and my two great aunts. And uh, I went to a lot of different schools. All of them were Catholic schools when I was younger. You know, so that was interesting. I mean, I guess I, I, I really liked the, the whole, um, uh, the whole, tr I guess the various traditions of it. And not to mention there's a lot of music involved too. So, um, you know, big, big cathedrals and organs and singing and unison and everything. So, you know, that was cool. Yeah, my, uh, but yeah, my dad, that side of the family is very Irish Catholic. So it was very important for me to, to do that. But I don't know, all in all, I feel, I feel that was a pretty positive experience really. Oh yeah, I should also mention that I grew up an only child, so yes, that's important. So I definitely have always kind of liked being on my own because you know, I'm drawing, you know, drawing or reading or building Legos when I was younger. Um, but yeah, moving around a lot, I kind of, I don't know, I, did, I got used to, uh, definitely got used to just kind of doing my own thing and I would usually have, well, I always saw it as a, uh, when I was in a lot younger in elementary school, I kind of felt like I would usually attract all the kind of like misfits and like the nerds and you know, kind of the weird kids. But I would kind of, I would sort of end up being sort of like king of the weirdos. And I, every school I went to, and I'm like, it always turned out that way. Kind of like I always thought of it as like I felt like I was like Bart Simpson and I had a bunch of mill houses around me or something. I don't know, but. <laughs> Yeah, going to public school from Catholic school was um, was an experience. I think it was eighth grade was the first time I went to a public school, and it was like it was a lot because I honestly hadn't really even been around like swearing, and it was like I don't know. I guess not that I was necessarily naive, but I hadn't. I mean, I just I just didn't think about things like that, like swearing or drugs or anything like that. But uh. You know, yeah, it was weird. But um, but going to all the so many different schools definitely. I mean, I had lots of different friends. I really got pretty good at just kind of being a chameleon and making friends with whoever. So I was constantly drawing when I was younger. I was obsessed with becoming a cartoonist. I just drew all the time, and I usually got in trouble in school because I would be drawing, not paying attention. Just weird cartoons and eyeballs. The very I was very influenced by Ren and Stimpy. I had a lot of pet mice when I was younger, because back then, and still now, I, I've always wanted to be a mad scientist. I have a, a drawing that I made when I was eight that says when I grow up, I want to be a mad scientist. And it's still true. I'm still working on it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Well, I first started playing music when I was Seven, I, my mom uh, had me take piano lessons, which, which ironically I hated for like, cause I think I, I took them till I was 12 or 13 and I just, I always hated piano lessons. I mean, I not I hate is a strong word, but I didn't like to practice and I kind of was like, but I did have uh, a couple of different teachers. My main teacher though was this um, guy, Dave, in Iowa City and he like, uh, he knew that I, didn't like doing piano lessons, but my mom was making me, so he he let me kind of like learn whatever I wanted to learn. So I ended up just picking out a bunch of um, books of like the Star Wars um, soundtrack, and he let me like learn all those, like the Darth Vader theme and you know, everything. And I just kind of learned by learning Star Wars songs. And then, but then guitar and stuff and songwriting that didn't happen until I was like 15, and I just kind of. It was shortly after the first time I ever smoked marijuana, and then I discovered uh, acoustic guitar and uh, the music of the Beatles, and then I started writing songs. As cliche as that sounds, that's how it happened. 
I don't know, the guitar that I found, it was actually an old guitar of my mom's that I found in the basement one day. It was a tiny little guitar, too. I like nylon string. I remember just kind of finding it one day and then I just started teaching myself some chords. Yeah, when I started to write songs, I kind of thought about it the way when I used to, I would draw cartoons when I was younger. I mean, each piece that I was working on, that I would work on forever, where, you know, where you do the, there's like the, I was doing pencil, so it would be all like you do the first little sketch and then you kind of go like harder and, you know, darken in the lines and then shade in everything. And I guess I kind of thought about songwriting in the same way, where like, you know, I get the chords and then you make the melody and then you put in the words and there's like these layers. I guess I always thought about it uh, the same way. See, this is tough, but I think the first song that I ever wrote uh, was one called City of Blood. And I was like, I was, uh, yeah, I was 15. And uh, it was like a two chord song, it just kind of went back and forth. And it was just basically about how like Iowa City is like a it's like a dark, depressing place because I was 15 and I was all depressed all the time. Uh, so I believe that was my first song. And then Three Cheers for the Wicked, which was technically about my first job at McDonald's. And then, but actually if I go way back to my first song, I remember that I, I don't know what it sounds like now. I wish maybe my mom has this somewhere, but in one of my piano lessons when I was like 10, my teacher had me, uh, like, wanted me to, like, compose my own song, and I remember I made this really short little thing, and I don't remember what it sounded like or what it was called, I just know that it was very influenced by The Legend of Zelda. That's all I can really remember. <laughs> I don't know, I, I have, I like to put a lot of, um, double, sometimes triple meanings into things, because I kind of, I'll tend to make songs that are, they sound like they're kind of, like, about a weird thing, but it's actually, like, deeply personal and like when I sit down and write songs it's a frustrating process because I usually just I have a little piano room at my house and I just kind of sit there for hours talking to myself until something happens sometimes it won't for hours or even days or weeks or anything but yeah I don't know it's like a, um, I don't know it's tough though it is tough but uh, I guess I like, uh, I like to write happy songs about really sad things, so, yeah. Right when I got out of high school and I had this girlfriend named Monica McKay, and uh, uh, it was right after I got done with high school, I hadn't had the graduation ceremony yet, but we were going out on this camping trip, we were driving out there, I was driving her car. And the tire blew out, and we skidded over in the other lane and got hit by a car, and she was killed instantly. And I ended up with a broken femur in my hand, uh, which was unfortunate because now I, I, ever since then, I don't really draw anymore. But didn't hear the music. But uh, so yeah, I was in the hospital for a while, and that was really tough. And to deal with. I mean, it still is. I mean, it's kind of like a total, like, Vietnam War flashback kind of deal. I can remember real vividly. So, that's always been a thing. A struggle. But that's how, like, music has really helped with that, though, because it's definitely a medium to uh, talk about that. Because, I mean, if I, actually, honestly, if I wasn't able to, like, get up on a stage and scream sometimes, I mean, who knows. But, <laughs> it was, you know, that was, that was tough. But then I, um, but then after that, well, then I had to graduate, uh, I graduated in a wheelchair, highly medicated on morphine, and, uh, you know, the whole audience gave me, like, a standing ovation, which I thought was actually kind of rude, because I couldn't stand up, but, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and eventually when I was a little better, but I was still walking with a cane, I did end up, you know, I went, I sold like an old car that I had and saved up some money and I went on an Amtrak and I went just traveling across the country to like find myself. I ended up, and I did go out to like visit Monica's family that lived out in uh, Reno, uh, Nevada and like in California and kind of like just kind of got to know about her and got to do a lot of really weird adventures. Um, 
while I was walking around with my guitar and my cane. And but yeah, I don't know. It's always been a thing. It's, I mean, I mean, I'm still even one of our newest songs is still about her. It's just kind of it's a, just always a thing. Actually, the first time I met Joe was I think tenth yeah tenth grade. I was at Diamond Dave's in the Sycamore Mall in Iowa City, and uh, he wandered in with some of his friends. They were like they all had like like spiky punk hair and they were wearing like duct tape masks and their big jinko jeans and at that point I was already kind of like a stoner kid and I was just like I remember just being like huh, who are these kids what are they doing here <laughs> but because yeah because Joe's uh, a few years younger than me so um, but I think and it was also at Diamond Dave's I was outside of Diamond Dave's playing the guitar and he was out there and he like heard me playing some of my songs I wrote and he uh, you know he I guess has been in band since he was like seven and he just was immediately like hey you should be in a band you should be in a band together which I'd never really, really even considered honestly but you know and then that's kind of how that started <laughs> that was uh, my song three cheers for the wicked that he heard me playing and then he just like was really into it even his mom has told me about how much he was talking about it that day when he came home and was like saying like yeah there's this guy and he was playing the song it's really cool and I just think that's, that's nice. Well originally I met Joe and uh, then we had our friend Jacob and we very briefly had like a three person stoner jam thing that we called Liquid Glodge. Not really sure why uh, we just made really just kind of silly songs and just, uh, I always had a video camera with me, this little, like, uh, this little one, and, you know, we just kind of, like, videotape ourselves making these songs, there's, like, and they were just kind of goofy, and then from that, it was Joe's, uh, 16th birthday party, and, you know, he's got all the instruments there, because he's been in bands forever, and Josh was there, because he, we had recently become friends with him through other friends, and, uh, Joe just was like, hey, do you guys want to jam? And we just kind of, I was playing like, I think I was playing City of Blood. And then, oh yeah, so this would have been, okay, yeah. So, and then Josh had never played drums before, but he just kind of hopped on there. And Joe was playing guitar, and I think that was, no, it was the three of us. And, uh, and then we just kind of decided to be a band at that point. But then, and then Joe had a friend from another band who came and he played guitar and Joe started playing bass. But the first show ever was Battle of the Bands uh, at the Old Capitol Mall in Iowa City. And uh, I was, I think I was eight, 18 at the time. And uh, we, uh, we played and all this old stuff. I didn't have a piano then, it was just the acoustic guitar. And we, during our second song, there was a big mosh pit that happened, even though we were playing like kind of folky acoustic stuff. This big mosh pit uh, broke out and a girl in the audience got trampled and broke her femur and we had to stop in the middle of the set while the paramedics came in and took her out. And, um, and then eventually Joe ended up dating this girl, Alyssa, uh, until she eventually passed away from uh, complications from a heart transplant and it was just the strangest thing that that all happened in our first show because you know when people say to go out there and break a leg and people tell me that I'm like F. you're like you don't understand that can actually happen which I mean it <laughs> and it's just yeah and the judges at that metal band just hated us they hated us I think for that and it was like I don't know it was funny but and I was like so nervous about it. Even before the show, I actually, I got all Catholic about it, and I actually made the other guys like sit down with me while I said like some Catholic prayers. They just thought I was such a weirdo doing that, but I was just like I was. I don't know. Ned was in uh, the band that actually won the Battle of Bands, and uh, his mom approached me afterwards and was like, "My son really likes your band, and he really like wants to play with you guys, but uh, you know he wasn't sure." If 
if you should talk to you or not. And I was just like, yeah. And like, and I knew him because like, or I knew of Ned because we were mutual friends. And uh, yeah, then he ended up jamming with us, and and then, then it's just been the four of us since then. Yeah, on the road, I yeah, it's it's amazing that we all get along and haven't killed each other, and the four of us in the van all the time. I mean that we're just lucky in that way. I mean, it's not like we always get along, but, I mean, you know, we're always civil. And, I mean, you know, we all each have our individual relationships with each other. Excuse me. And, uh, I guess, you know, and I, you know, and they're my brothers. I mean, I, I feel like, uh, in a way, even though I didn't grow up with siblings and I have these other siblings, you know, real half siblings. I mean, since maybe I don't understand what an actual growing up with a sibling relationship is like, but if I were to describe it, I would feel like the relationship I have with those guys is like an actual like brother sibling relationship because you know it's a love and hate kind of thing. You know, where it's like I'm not gonna ever like do them wrong or anything. Sometimes I, I hate their guts, but it doesn't make me love them any less. It's just kind of how it is. So I guess that's probably, and I think all the other guys feel the same way, and I think that's really what has helped us get along. I mean, even it, it's just, even like in when we spend enough time in the van and just riding around, we actually get to the point, it's kind of gross, where if one of us farts, we all know who it was. Like, we can identify each individual's fart smell because we spend that much time with each other. <laughs> Or friends with benefarts. <laughs> oh, and I also should mention Ian was also briefly the bassist in that. Ian Kaler um, was, uh, he actually came up with the name Dead Larry, too. It was his idea for us to be called Dead Larry. Because people always ask, who's Larry? And then we're always like, Larry's dead. And, but, um, and the thing is, so, when my grandparents um, lived in this big old kind of mansion that was separated into these like separate apartments, but they're like house-sized apartments, and they had this neighbor Larry, who um, I actually remember from when I was younger because he even babysat me a couple times. He was always drinking, he was always drinking and smoking, <laughs> and it was like kind of looked like Ronald Reagan, and uh, but he didn't really have any family, um, and. When my and he died, and the when he died, like the bank just froze all his assets, and all his stuff was just kind of sitting in the house forever. And when my grandparents died, I was helping to clean out the house um, a little bit. I mean, I actually ended up living there for a while after that. But uh, I went up in the attic and realized the attic connected to Larry's attic, and it just had this little push-down spring-loaded kind of door that went down. And I was like, I think I was. I was 17, and I went down in there and realized like, like nothing had been touched in there. Like his shoes were out of the bed, his cigarette butts were in the ashtray. Like nobody had been in there, and it was like going into some ancient tomb. And I, it was the weirdest thing, because like I, you know, I felt like I was like an archaeologist, which, um, which my dad was an archaeologist before I was born. So that <laughs> took the total side note there. So, anyways. Uh, but yeah, I ended up, um, uh, of course, you know, taking all the liquor from his liquor cabinet, which was actually just wasn't really a liquor cabinet, it was just really underneath the sink, he had all this liquor. They were like 17. Actually, I was going to take one bottle, and then I was like, well, what if somebody notices that something's missing? And then I was like, well, if I just take all of it, <laughs> nobody will know anything was even under that sink. And uh, he had this big blue suitcase upstairs, and I just put all the liquor in there, it was so much, there's so much liquor. And uh, I also ended up taking a suit, and I wore Larry's uh, suit to the homecoming dance. And uh, people thought that was pretty weird, but <laughs> I, I thought it was great. And, and uh, but yeah, I ended up taking the big blue suitcase of Larry's liquor uh, back to Iowa City, and uh, you know, me and Joe and Josh and I don't think Ned, yeah, Ned wasn't around to actually drink any of that liquor. We drank all of Larry's liquor for days, and, uh, and then we you know, were jamming together and stuff, and then that was eventually how we ended up calling ourselves Dead Larry. 
and uh, you know, and we went back a few other times. I brought Joe and Jacob there a few times. I brought my dad there. I would just like have parties and just like bring people over to Larry's house. So, you know, I still have a re recurring nightmare of that I'm stuck in Larry's house and people are like going to show up at the door and they're going to find me in there. It's like a recurring nightmare I have all the time. You know, I mean, I even have a picture. Uh, I have an old picture of like me sitting on his lap when I'm like four and stuff, which is, and it, oh, this is really weird. So actually this picture my mom just found recently of me sitting on Larry's lap, I'm four, and I'm wearing like, like overalls, and Larry's wearing this shirt, which is actually one of the shirts that I took, that I still have, that I wear sometimes, but like, I didn't know that until like, because I just saw this picture a couple of years ago, and I was like, holy shit, that's the shirt that I saw, and he's wearing it in this picture, and I'm there sitting on his lap. Ooh. <laughs> So there's this other part to the Dead Larry story that I don't um, that I don't tell people a lot, but it's about the last time that I ever saw Larry alive. Because um, I was sitting in uh, my grandparents' kitchen, and I was pretty stoned. I was just kind of doodling, and there's like a knock at the door because like the basements were also connected. There's like a communal um, laundry room. There's a knock at the door, and there's Larry, and he was starting. He had been getting Alzheimer's pretty bad. And he's coming in and he's saying all this stuff saying that he's locked out of his house or something and he needs to use the phone. But then he starts going on about and I'm like, okay, well, and I walked him over there, but like the door was unlocked. But then he started saying, no, there's someone trying to break into my house. There's someone in my house. And he kept going on about that. And I was like, I don't know. And he was like calling, and then he was on the phone calling people from his house that he was locked out of his house and then somebody was breaking in. And then after the fact when I thought about that I imagined this like you know sci-fi scenario where there's like a wormhole and at that moment that I first went into Larry's house he was going over to my grandparents house to tell me that someone's breaking into his house and yeah you know I I don't know exactly how I started with all well I guess when we were first playing music festivals um, we would be there and like you know and everybody's like all happy and and you know, and their tie dye and stuff. But I would technically, I would be like walking around, like wearing like like a black suit, and just like drinking whiskey and just like, just you know, just being kind of grumpy. And that's how I got the nickname McDarkness. So that's how that started. So I guess I just kind of rolled with that. And uh, you know, and I mean, I you know, I don't know. And I I really, I definitely grew up with things like you know Tim Burton and Nightmare Before Christmas and Ren and Stimpy, which are, are all kind of dark but also goofy things, I guess, and I've just always associated with that sort of thing. I, I, I don't know, I, it's like, I'm not like I'm trying to like put stuff in, in people's face, but for some reason I just feel like there's enough, you know, there's enough things about, um, about, uh, you know, I guess the lighter side of things. And, you know, sometimes... I don't know. I mean, the, the, you can't have a light side without the dark side. <laughs> I mean, that's really all it comes down to. And I, you know, I just like to make people aware of that. <laughs> I especially always thought that the Yacht Club was a, was a really appropriate venue for Dead Larry to be playing at because it's the old Johnson County morgue. And just that, compa you know, compared to the fact that it looks a lot like the Cavern Club where the Beatles started, I just, that was great. And, you know, we've played there for years now. I remember playing there when you could smoke in bars and I have no idea how I handled that <laughs> because there's no ventilation down there. You know, and then we also did, you know, as time went on, we did like a, a bunch of Battle of the Bands at the Yacht Club. We won like five Battle of the Bands in a row this one, or like through a couple of years, and we just like, became like the Yacht Club Battle of the Bands champions. And uh, that was a good time. <laughs> uh, well, being on stage is, is awesome, and it's, um, I still find it to be terrifying. Uh, but, you know, it's, 
it's a chance, it's a, I don't know, the big thing is it's a chance to just like be a completely different person, which I mean, I feel like the me on, that's on stage is not the same, it's just the me that's normal, because a lot of times, um, you know, I'm pretty mellow and subdued normally, but I try to be pretty theatrical on stage. Uh, but no, I mean, it's the best, I mean, it's the best rush ever. I mean, it, it, and you can't, I mean, there's really nothing better than getting a huge, you know, a reaction out of a big group of people. Um, but still nerve wracking. I mean, I still, I will still puke out of anxiety before shows um, often. That happens a lot. I mean, it's, you know, even if they we're only playing in front of a handful of people, you know, sometimes that's more nerve wracking. It's actually easier with a bigger crowd, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I love it. People and they've been loyal fans and watched us grow up and I mean, I think there are like eight people uh, that have like Dead Larry tattoos now and like, I mean, people that tell me that, you know, like, they've been going to our shows for years and then like, uh, you know, they were like went to like came to our shows when they were pregnant and then like, you know, and then like they have, they have people that show, send me videos of their kids listening to our music. I mean, it's crazy. And it's like, uh, I mean, it gives me a lot of hope, especially because, I mean, obviously, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd like to, like, make it big or at least, you know, that sort of thing. But it gives me hope that I feel like if we can just, anybody we can just get in front of, I feel like, I mean, people, you know, tend to connect with us. And it's not even about the music sometimes. I'm not really sure, but we always seem to attract um, certain people and uh, that, you know, for when other may have kind of felt a little hopeless before and then uh, and it's like I don't know, really know why, especially because I'm like singing about all the sad stuff, but I feel like maybe it's, maybe it has something to do uh, with that, like, I don't know, that, you know, maybe we're not really like beating around the bush with things like, hey, everything sucks, but, you know, here we are, <laughs> so let's party, I don't know, <laughs> and so, uh, where was I going with that, but, uh, yeah, no, it's really weird, and it's humbling, I mean, I, yeah, I love everybody that's stuck with us, it's amazing, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't really feel like I deserve it sometimes, but, like, it just everybody's amazing, it's, like, it's great, I think so. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, playing in Iowa City was, you know, I've been a huge advantage for us because, I mean, there's so many bands and, it, you know, there's so many people that were, are always going out to see music and, that you know, everything's kind of in walking distance, so everybody's coming out to the shows. And, uh, yeah, I think, it, I think that uh, definitely helped us a lot because it's almost like a... So, because, you know, it's not a huge city, but it's like it's got everything that a big city has, just on a smaller level, so it's like almost, you know, it worked out really well. Um, you know, and then we went to the Twin Cities up in Minneapolis, because we thought that was kind of the next step. It's the next kind of bigger city, not like immediately to like a New York or Portland or San Francisco or something like that. It's kind of the next step. So, I mean, I also had personal reasons for wanted to move to Minnesota, but it all kind of worked out. So I, was, I, could, I was born in Minneapolis, but I didn't really live there. But then, like, my dad uh, moved up there and got married, um, you know, I guess when I was, you know, a teenager. Because I actually also went, I went to high school for a little bit in Minneapolis, too. Actually, two schools. Two of the high schools I went to were in Minneapolis. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, so I was definitely, um, familiar with it too, which helped, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, and plus you have, it's not that far from Iowa, and it's already got all these iconic things, I mean, you got Prince, and you got First Avenue and stuff, so, it's, you know, it's already, it's got good music cred. I guess, I mean, it feels probably the same as anything else, with, as far as growing up, and, you know, when people, you know, when anybody grows up, and you go spread your wings, and you go out on your own, um, you know, but it is pretty cool, um, you know, I feel fortunate, too, that we've done, you know, as well as we have, because, I mean, there's definitely a lot of bands that we played with in Iowa City when we were starting that don't exist anymore, and we're still just 
we're still doing it. <laughs> and we're still the same four dudes. <laughs> so I don't think that Minneapolis is going to be our last stop either. I think that we'll probably end up um, somewhere else in the near future as well. I think we've all been talking about Oregon as a possibility. So, um, yeah. I grew up an only child, and now uh, I have three siblings. Um, and uh, so that's weird. Uh, because, yeah, then my, my little brother, he's 13 now, and he, he was born and he was diagnosed with severe autism. And, you know, same dad, so half, half brother, so, you know, my dad and his wife had him up in Minnesota, that's where he was born. Um, and, uh, you know, and now, as my day job, I am his uh, PCA home health care aide, because, you know, I worked at in between doing the touring, I worked at, you know, a group home places and assisted living kind of things, and so, which is, you know, and he needs the same kind of care, so now I'm, like, staff for him, which is pretty cool, and he recently got his own piano, and he has been, I've noticed that he has been composing something. It's like, I just noticed he always is adding little pieces to it, but he plays the same notes every time. Even though it sounds chaotic, I can tell what's going on there. And then, when my dad passed away in 2013, and then I ended up gaining even more siblings, because, I mean, I knew, I had learned when I was a teenager that he had had two daughters um, before I was born, but, like, I'd never really met them or talked to them or anything, but I had connected with one of them on Facebook, so then when he died, I got a hold of her, and I uh, was like, hey, you know, like, our dad died. And then she, and then surprisingly enough, she ended up, uh, she flew out to St. Paul, um, and then we got really drunk together, <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, I have a sister now, too. And, uh, you know, and that's really weird, because, and then, and now she lives with us, now she lives with us in St. Paul, and she's dating Ned. <laughs> it's like, life is weird. And not only that, uh, so, then I find out that my sister Bridget, my estranged half-sister, uh, she also is a performer, and she uh, does live um, shadow casting of the Rocky Horror Picture Show out in San Francisco, where she lives. And so, you know, after she's out there for the for the funeral, and then she comes to a show, we actually played with Wookie Foot in Ames the same day as my dad's funeral, and we still did it, and she came with us. I was still in the same suit from the funeral, when Wookie Foot actually said some nice stuff uh, about him, so that was cool. And uh, yeah, and then um, over that year then we ended up touring out to California and we did some shows with her because we opened up for Rocky Horror Picture Show and she also has a, a like a burlesque troupe, so it would be like Dead Larry and Burlesque and all these shows around the Bay Area. And, uh, and then there's this girl named Xena who is also part of the Burlesque Troupe and the Rocky Horror uh, uh, show and everything, who is friends with my sister, and uh, now I am dating her, and she lives with me in St. Paul, too. <laughs> so, it's, you know, it's crazy the, the thing, you know, the domino effect of events, like, go from, like, all right, my dad died, and then all of a sudden, you know, then I've got a sister and a girlfriend from California, <laughs> and... Yeah, my dad always, um, well, my dad was a, uh, you know, he was an archaeologist before I was born, and then he was a professor, and he taught at a couple, he had taught, like, the University of Minnesota and the University of Florida, but he, he was always working on this, this theory, this generational theory of time, where he, he, uh, would write out these huge charts about, like, how history repeats itself, and was, like, scientifically trying to, like, show how history repeats itself, and... I guess that's probably where I got the whole cyclical thing from. And he also used to say, uh, he would always say, um, uh, there's no such thing as coincidence, it's just God's way of remaining anonymous. And he always said that. And that's definitely something that sticks with me. Whether or not I actually am that religious or spiritual anymore, which I'm not really, but, you know, I mean, I definitely think there's some sort of a, pattern and flow to things because some I mean some things you do I mean you just have to admit when some things like that happen it's just too weird 
to like just you know you know makes you think that you know maybe there is a there's just a there's a flow when you go with the flow I guess that you know <laughs> when they say to go with the flow that's what it is so I mean music has given me I mean quite literally I mean I've got to visit uh, all kinds of cool places that I never would have seen otherwise I mean just from playing music and touring and met people I would have never met and had experiences I would have never had um, and that, I mean the, quite literally that's you know the biggest thing that it's given me other than the fact that also it's it's given me an outlet um, to just deal with you know deep dark feelings and uh, you know I, I mean I, I my favorite thing in the world to do is just to sit alone and just play the piano maybe have a drink and just kind of just think about stuff I don't know it's um this music is well you, you know it, you're saying how I uh, I tend to make everything I, these connections and put everything into this cycle in a loop but that's what song writing is I mean it is it's just a it's a formula that you know it goes back and it just you know um, it can music I mean it does reflect life it reflects time really I mean that's what it is I mean music is time basically not to be too weird but I mean it is <laughs> so well I know I said in the questions happiness is a warm gun which you know good Beatles but happiness I mean ultimately I guess happiness is just uh, I mean doing what you want to do well that's not a good answer happiness <laughs> uh, Happiness is finding uh, what you love, or who you love, or where you love, and like being able to spend your life uh, doing or with, you know, the people and things you love. I mean, that's all it really comes down to, I guess. Uh, I like to play the piano. Uh, my girlfriend makes me happy. Um, you know, seeing new places makes me happy. Uh, macaroni and cheese makes me very happy. Uh, also, milk and cookies and ice cream. And um, you know, uh, science fiction makes me very happy. So I mean, if I had a combination of like a perfect evening where I like play the piano for a little bit, have a drink, and then you know, snuggle up with my girlfriend and watch Star Trek or The Outer Limits and have some cookies and milk. I mean, that's that's happiness right there. <laughs> right. Uh, words of wisdom, I would say, to other musicians, because I remember, you know, and we're playing with Zeta June here tonight, and, you know, we're staying with them, but I remember a long time ago, when they were first starting out, and they were at Camp Euphoria, and they came up to me, and they asked me if I could give them any tips on, like, being in a band, and I would still, you know, I hope, I think they have taken this to heart by the shows so I've seen them perform the last couple nights, because I told them, that the most important thing is that you put on the best show you can and perform as well as you can whether there are a thousand people in front of you or there's just like one guy at the bar like don't don't have any kind of an attitude or like feel like you know you're better than anything because if, even if you make that one person at the bar uh, if you play the best show you've ever played for that one person they will be a fan for life and you know that I it's just what I like to tell younger musicians and stuff because um, I mean, it's just the truth of I me. Mean. Hey, 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 yes! Bananas! You know, I could probably have it down a little bit here, actually. Hey, 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 hey! Hey, hey, hey! hey.